here at Morton's, the Steakhouse in downtown Los Angeles. Maxim Marcellus, 710 ESPN. Mark Willard sitting in for Marcellus Wiley today. We are here with the great Luke Robitaille, who thought he was going to get to eat, but actually you're being starved right. until, uh, <laughs> until after this interview, aren't you, Luke? That's, that's how I got here. Like, they told me uh, you could come to Morton's and eat. I'm like, what? Right, who doesn't want to eat at Morton's, the steakhouse? He, of doesn't, know, he doesn't know all these people are here for. <laughs> Little did you know you'd have to lunch. put up with Mark Willard today. Yeah. Isn't that right? I wasn't Stop. aware of that. <laughs> Luke, uh, what I love about your story is that you were overlooked by everybody. The Kings are the only team that talked to you. You get drafted 100 slots after Tom Glavin, who winds up winning 300 games in the major leagues. You can't skate is what they said. You get sent to the equivalent of the minor leagues, right, in hockey for a couple of years before you even get called up to the big club. And you wind up in the Hall of Freaking Fame? Are you kidding me? How, tell, how does that happen? What does that mean for other people? So that's why they write it H O F F, all of freaking fame. That's all right, freaking like that. fame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an inspiration. It, 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 your story. It was actually the story. Goes, it was, there was one man that believed in me, and it happened to be that the L.A. scout that was lived in Ottawa, where I played my junior in hall in Canada, which is right across the river. And this one gentleman is the only one, literally, <coughs> that believed in me. And he's the one that pushed uh, Rogie Vashon to draft me in the ninth round, like you said, after Tom Glavin, when Tom Glavin clearly said before the draft, I will never play hockey. And the Kings still drafted him ahead of me. It's amazing. <laughs> 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 Think about that. <laughs> so, it is amazing. Now, what, I mean, your story's an inspiration because it shows no matter what other people say about you, mm -hmm. you believe in yourself, you keep working hard, you can be great at something when no one else thinks you can be. What did this guy, who was it, what did he see in you uh, that no one else saw? I think it, well, the one thing is because he was living so close, he got to see all of our games. And, and in, in all fairness, the year I got drafted, we didn't have a good team in junior. So, uh, so not too many scouts were watching our team. And he saw all the games. And I think he probably saw the passion I had for the game. Like, you know, we were losing a lot of games, and I was constantly trying to get better, and I was trying to improve. And I think it, later in years, that's what he told me. That was the biggest thing for him. And, uh, you know, that was, you know, if you have the passion for things, you know, you can, you can accomplish anything. And I think for me, too, at the time, even though I got drafted in the ninth round, my, my biggest thing was I remember thinking, I'm on the list. So now I have a chance. I'll make the best out of my chance. So, Luke, while GMs and experts are all sitting here talking about it and telling you and telling everyone around you that, that you have these holes in your game and you're, and you're not good enough. At that time, what did you think of your pro prospects? Uh, I, I, I remember draft, being drafted in the ninth round. I mean, it, you know, it was a long wait and for, for me to get to hear my name. I was there. It was at the Montreal Forum at the time of the draft. But I really, at the time, I just thought, I kept hearing about my skating, so what I tried to do is every summer and during the season, I would try to improve my skating, you know. In my mind, I was, I was quicker than everybody else. Obviously, on video, and people were saying, obviously, they had different opinions. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I just, I was always trying to improve what my weakness was. And if I heard people say a negative thing about me, I try to prove them wrong. And if I heard someone say something positive, I try to prove them right. That was kind of a little bit the way I was thinking. You mentioned being at the draft. And I read that you ran into, or at least went to introduce yourself to Rogi Vashon after, yeah. he, uh, after the Kings picked you. What was that conversation like? Well, the, the, the way it happens when I got picked, it, it, in those days, the draft was one day. So the draft started at 1 p.m., if I'm not mistaken, that day. I heard my name. It was about 7, 8 p.m. that night. So I sat all day at the Montreal Forum. For anyone that's ever been to Montreal Forum in, in, in Canada, they, they're known as having the best hot dogs in sports. So, better than the Dodger dogs. I love the Dodger dog, but do, they are yeah. better. Different, different way they toast the buns. Look, come on, you've been, you've been in LA I'm long telling enough. You, you don't come to LA no, and I say love that. The Dodger, I'm telling you, I love the Dodger dogs, but you yeah. got to try them there one time. They toast the buns. Uh, so, it's a little bit different. Yeah, you know? so damn, Dodger dogs. <laughs> let, let, you got to toast the buns. Look, look, thin. Let's, let's face it about the Dodger dogs. No, you will not win that one. I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to argue against with you. I'm just going to say, I understand Dodger, Dodger dogs are very long. That's yeah, for sure. Very long, but yeah. the, the best the hot dog in the country. And, they, and but they're we good. Can, there's something yeah, that argument about yeah. them. Yeah. They're longer, but not as tasty as what you So saying. anyway, yeah. seven hot dogs later is when I heard my <laughs> name called. <laughs> you know, when you're 18, you can eat a lot of hot dogs. So I was about a, a, 
and a, a hot dog a, an hour. What? That was about my, my, my tone for that draft. But anyway, I heard my name. I ran down. There was no one left in the building, and security <laughs> wouldn't let me on to go like on the ice. Hey, kid, there. what are you doing here? Yeah. <laughs> right. uh, and uh, someone says, no, no, I heard his name. So I went to the table. Actually, it wasn't Rogi Vashon. It was someone that was w working for our team. His name was John Wolf, and he was just there. And literally, I think there was a couple other scouts at the end of the table. And I looked at him, I go, I'm Luke Robitaille. He's looking, he's like, who? So he looks at his list, he goes, oh yeah, we just drafted you. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, he, and I remember he made me fill up like um, a piece of paper where it would be my address. He go, fill up your agent's name. I said, well, I don't have any agents. It's just me. So I fill up my name, my address. And, uh, and I was trying to, to kind of teach, to teach him that I could speak English, but I really couldn't. So even though I still struggle a little bit with it, as you can tell, but I, um, so I remember writing and then he looks at me, he goes, well, I don't have any jersey or any hats, I got a pin. So he gave me his pin. So from, from his jacket, <laughs> literally gave me his king's pin, that was it. So I left and this is, if you keep in mind, this is the end of June. And then by the, the end of July, I kept telling my dad, I think I wrote the wrong address because they weren't sending me any letters. I wasn't hearing from anyone. <laughs> And I think by like about August 10, I finally got a letter from the guy. I still got it, that letter somewhere. That's the and, uh, start of a <laughs> Hall of Fame career. Right. That's amazing to me. Coming up, this is what I, I really want to know. And we'll, we'll, when we, when coming up, we'll get the answer from you, Luke. That you say people thought you weren't strong enough skater. That you, when you felt you were, but they didn't, obviously, that when they watched video. But we see this across all sports now because it's such big business. Best business practices have replaced this kind of scout's guts instinct because they're wrong a lot of the time. Um, and we see this in baseball with like Moneyball, right? That whole story that's been made into a movie. What I want to know from you coming up is how, because you always had the ability to put the puck in the net. How did you do that? And why did, how, how did you get, how, what level of that ability? How were you able to do it? And why did everyone miss that for the first nine rounds of that draft? Max and Marcellus, Mark Willard, sitting in, Luke Robitaille here at Morton's The Steakhouse in downtown Los Angeles for lunch with a legend, 710 ESPN. Lunch with a legend, live from Morton's The Steakhouse in downtown Los Angeles. Max and Marcellus, Mark Willard in for Marcellus Wiley today. Lunch with a legend, and the legend is Luke Robitaille. Now, Mark Willard said, I wouldn't say this to your face. I say you're the, you're the best scoring left winger since Bill Clinton. Right or wrong? <laughs> <laughs> JFK? I mean, is that? No. So how do Pretty you? Pretty good. So in terms of the skating stuff, well, is he, he's not skating. What did you think looking back now at your skating at that time? Um, I mean, I, I didn't think because I was playing, but I, I do remember asking my dad at one point. My dad was always good to me in a way where he never really talked much about hockey, but he never missed my games or practice. But I do remember asking him one time, I think I was like 15, I said, Dad, am I really that slow? Because he always heard that. And he says, all I know, if there's a loose puck, like in hockey, if there's a loose puck around the net or in the corner, he always seems to be first on the puck. So keep doing what you're doing. I said, that's, all right, thanks, Dad. That's the point. In other words, like we, this is, I mentioned Moneyball because in the book, Michael Lewis writes about how scouts would be like, he doesn't look like a ball player. His butt's not high enough. And he's like, yeah, but look, he's getting on base 40% of the time. Mm -hmm. What was it about you that enabled you to get to that puck first and to score so well, which seems to be something you've always been able to do? Um... I mean, obviously, I love the game. It was a passion for me. And I think because of that, I was always a student of the game. So I, if I saw a player that I thought was better than me, I always tried to learn from him something I could, I could maybe pick up that I could do. Sometimes you see someone who has extreme amount of talent. You can't do what they can do, but they always have something that they're doing special that maybe you can learn. So I try to learn from different players what they were doing special and try to kind of bring into my that own game. That is really interesting and I think applicable because, again, talking about a guy drafted in the ninth round, had to get a pin because they didn't know your name, and then yeah. you make the Hall of Fame. You're not saying just, I wanted it more than the other guy. Mm -hmm. You're saying, I wanted it more like a football guy on the line, a scrimmage. Mm -hmm. You're saying, I wanted it more than the other guy, so I studied the things I could use. Yeah, that's right. I mean, as an example, in junior, I was known more as, as a playmaker. My idol was Wayne Gretzky. So Wayne Gretzky, and even though he was a great goal scorer, like it, it, his playmaking was amazing. So I wanted to be this playmaker, but you know, as I got near my, my, my career in junior, I, I got to play with a guy who was 
probably the best pure goal scorer who's ever played. And I remember asking him, he said, why don't you teach me how to do those kind of quick one-timer shots that we call them and so forth. And, uh, and we worked on it for an entire season. And it changed my game. Luke, did that experience, you know, kind of being the underdog from the start of your career, uh, did that in any way help later on? I mean, I, I think of a time like when you were leaving the Rangers. There were a lot of people, again, here come the experts, want to give up on you and say that your, your career is, is, is pretty much done. Uh, and, and I would imagine that that as, at the same time is both hurtful and motivational. So was that a good or a bad thing for your career? Well, I, I never saw myself as an underdog, funny enough. You know, I mean, I, you know, that's the word you always hear outside. But I didn't see myself that way. I kind of just saw myself that I wanted to be the best that I could be. You know, actually, I competed with myself just to be the best. Uh, but you, the thing about the Rangers, yeah, like when I went there, funny, like a, in our game where a situation happened where you're playing a little bit less and so forth. And for me, the first, the two years in New York were the only year, years in my career where I got hurt. You know, I got broken foot and a broken foot the next year. And, you know, I had gotten a broken ankle right and I, I left the Kings the, the year prior. So it, Wrong town like, to get hurt in. I know, yeah. Right. <laughs> but but I, it, it was kind of funny, like, how I had all these injuries pile up suddenly out of nowhere. So you're right. When I, I, I came back to the Kings and I, I remember hearing, like, my career was on a downfall. Then I got a hernia surgery. That's my, my first season. So I knew I had to do something to turn my career. And, and I did. You know, well, I mean, you, you mentioned that Wayne Gretzky was your idol, as I imagine everyone who played hockey in a certain era practically, yeah. Wayne Gretzky's era, and you get to play with him <laughs> in L.A. at a time when hockey was being popularized in this part of the country as never before. Yeah. What was that like, first playing with your one-time idol and then having the level of success, getting to the finals uh, out here in, in Hollywood, you know, and blowing that up. What was that experience like? Well, the, the, the first year was really hard, funny enough, and, and I was so excited to kind of meet my idol and to see him, and he was our junior coach. I had met him a couple of times, but never really spoken with And And then when he came, you got to remember, like I was this 15, 14 year old kid, I was, I was crazy about hockey, so anything I could find about Gretzky, I would try to study, I mean, I'd have pictures and watch all the games. So by the time he got on my team, I, mean, I was so nervous. I couldn't, when you idolize someone that much, you don't, you don't believe they're going to have flaws. Not right. that Wayne has I try flaws, to but I hope Wayne's not listening. You don't have flaws, Wayne. I try to but, explain to Mark but, Willard this all the time. Mark, I'm not perfect. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, sorry. So it's hard, eh? It's hard when the guy has flaws. Actually, in this huh? case, like, no, no. no this is actually <laughs> very easy to see. Yeah. But, but I remember seeing Wayne where, you know, like he couldn't swear in my in my mind, you know. And if you're playing hockey and you miss a puck every once in a while, you're gonna throw the f bomb or something. Right. <laughs> and this was but shocking anyway, to you. Yeah, it was shocking to me to see Wayne do that, which he didn't do a lot, but it was still shocking. So I remember Wayne was this kind of player where, if you gave him the puck, it always came back to you. He was the greatest passer, greatest playmaker to ever play the game. And but I remember my first, probably second or third game, and I was kind of nervous, and I want to impress him. We're going on a two on one. And in my mind, I was like, I'm going to give him the best pass possible. He's Wayne Gretzky. And, and I get there, and I, I just as I, I make the pass, it kind of bounced and went in the corner. And we come back to the bench, and <clears throat> he's just trying to be the best. He's trying to help us win. He says to me, he says, he says hey, uh, Lucky, uh, just give it to me. I'll give it back to you. Give it to me quicker. I'll give it back to you. I was like, OK, OK, I'll give it to you. So for the next four months, every time I touched a puck, I just gave it to him. Like I remember the coaches would get mad at me and say, Luke, you got to skate with the puck. You got to do something. You can't just give it to Wayne. And it, 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 that's how much I wanted him to be pleased with my game, you know. And uh, it was it was difficult my first year. It took me almost two years to finally say, you know, he's just a player. Like and what, what was that relation? How did that relationship develop with him? Well, I would just sit at dinner and just, <laughs> just be dead, dead quiet. That's amazing. But to, to grow up idolizing the greatest mm -hmm. player ever, right? And mm -hmm. then to play with them side by side and to be a power. It's not like you were just a guy on the team. Mm -hmm. You were a key contributor on mm -hmm. an excellent team. Take us inside a little bit, the locker room, your relationship with Wayne Gretzky. Well, I mean, I, it was great for me to see him every day because I got to pick up a lot of little things he was doing that no one knew, you know, like I, that he did naturally. That was Unbelievable. I mean, everybody says, well, no one, you know, there's always the rumor no one wanted to hit Wayne and so forth. And if you really watch him close every day, they couldn't hit him. I mean, it was, it, that's how good he was. He was so quick and he turned faster than anyone else and his feet were always moving. So I try to pick up things that he was doing. So for me, I was constantly studying, trying to see if I could pick up a couple things here and there. But it was, uh, 
you know, it, it, it was, it was a lot of fun. By the time at least I got it out of my head that he was just, okay, he's just a hockey player. He's trying to help us win. And then it was, I had a great ride with him. It was, it was unbelievable. When you guys were, that, that group and, and that 93 team, I mean, it, it really changed the landscape of hockey, mm -hmm. not just here, but, but across the country, certainly in the yeah. western half of the United States. Could you feel that that was happening at the time? And, and besides the obvious of winning, Mm -hmm. What did you guys do to kind of fuel that as it was building? Yeah, well, the, we felt it in 88. When Wayne came in 1988, next thing you know, everybody of who's who in Hollywood was at our games. And then we were selling out every game. And, you know, we, we used to get a kick out of having all the celebrities sit on the glass. And I remember Ronald Reagan even fell asleep one game. He was there. And <laughs> it was kind of, kind of someone got hit there. And he, he did. He woke up. And it, we were, we, were, we got to, and then we were, you know, we were lining up to take a picture with him. It was was amazing. Well, he was, was a right winger. You're a left winger. One of the greatest yeah. memory. We, him, we, yeah. we still talk about about Ronald Reagan coming to our games. It was it was amazing. And uh, but you know we saw in '88 it's changed. And then in '89, and the thing that people forget when uh, when we got Wayne Gretzky, we got a lot of good players. We got John Tonelli, Mike Kurchineski, Marty McSorley was with us. We got a great goalie, Kelly Rudy. So we got a lot of good players. Suddenly we were competing, and uh, and you know it, it was fun. But in 92, 93, you know, the funny thing is, everybody said we were out that year because Wayne, if people remember, he got hurt. He, he hurt his back, I think, second day of training camp. And then he missed till January. And everybody says the Kings will never compete. And as a team, we kind of pulled together and we were doing well. And by the time he came back, it took him maybe 10 games or 12 games to really get back in shape. By the time he got back in it, it was unbelievable. He was the best player in the world again. And then by the time we got in the playoffs, we were so, so rolling as a team. It was, you know, we had a great ride. But because, you know, we had gone through up and down before him, we weren't a top team coming in the playoffs. We believed in ourselves as a team. So we made it a great run. You know, it was a lot of fun. But it, 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 was, it was really kind of the topper, you know, by the time we beat Toronto that, that year. 93 was as good as it got as it turns out, and yeah. you get your Stanley Cup, but not in L.A., mm -hmm. um, you wind up taking the cup back. Well, I want to get into all these stories. Yeah, okay. I want to get into all these stories coming up. And where it went wrong for the NHL that seemed to, we can obviously talk about the, 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 uh, missing, the missed season, but building such momentum out here in particular, and ha especially after the 93 season, getting so close, what your expectations were then for the future, what you think happened, what you think has happened since then. We're going to get into it all coming up on Max and Marcellus. Mark Willard sitting in for Marcellus Wiley. Lunch with a legend. The legend is Luke Robitaille, <laughs> Hall of Famer Luke Robitaille. Here at Morton's The Steakhouse in downtown LA, 710 ESPN. We are at Morton's The Steakhouse in downtown Los Angeles. Max and Marcellus, 710 ESPN. Mark Willard sitting in for Marcellus Wiley today. The legend lunching with us is the great, the Hall of Famer, Luke Robitaille, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Stanley Cup winner, but in Detroit. But a uh, big hand in popularizing hockey in the western part, as Mark Willard points out, of the United States especially that 1993 team that made it to the Stanley Cup, even though it fell short. You, Wayne Gretzky, and others. What, take, us, take us inside at that point. It's 1993. You guys are flying high. What did you think about the future at that moment? Well, uh, you know, you go through the playoffs, and it's, it's, there's a reason people say it's the hardest trophy to win because it's, like it's like a war for almost two months. And... Uh, you know, we're just playing one game at a time, and we were losing. I remember every series we were losing the first game, and then we'd come back and win. And Making we, you feel like a team of destiny, I'm sure, right? You think yeah. you're destined to win this thing. <laughs> I, yeah, but we didn't have, after in the Toronto scene, when we were down 3-2, we weren't sure. But, uh, you know, like every time we'd come back home to play, because we start every series on the road, too. And every time we would come back home, I mean, we'd see like the, the buzz, like, you know, the first series went well, like it was against Calgary. Second series against Vancouver, you know, like by, I think we won in game five, either game five or game six, I can't quite remember. And then when we got to Toronto and we came back for game three and it was 1-1 one, one, and then we, we realized like, this is getting crazy, you know? So, and then, then coming back and winning game six in overtime and then going to Toronto and we were like, 
you know, the, the, there was there was a buzz, and then we, you know, we won. I think it was Friday, and the finals were starting uh, Monday, so we had to go right away to, to Montreal from Toronto. By the time we came back in LA, it was it was unbelievable. I mean, everywhere we went, people were talking about it, and it was it was uh, amazing. I want you to tell another story. Everyone knows the. Uh the tradition when you are on a Stanley Cup winning team, you get to spend your, your day with the cup. Mm -hmm. Now, first, do I have this right? When you got your day with the cup with the wings, you brought the cup out here. Yeah, I did. Right yeah. here in L.A. Yeah. What, did, what did you do with it for your well, day? Well, I, um, I called. I, I mean, I went on my phone book and tried to reach as many friends that I knew liked hockey or touched hockey or touched my career, you know, for the first uh, 16 years I had played, you know, because I moved there in the in uh, 86 and uh, and basically we threw the first thing we had it for three days funny because chris chelios brought it in la too like he we kind of made it like a three-day party so the friday night uh, we, we kind of covered our pool did the whole thing in my backyard and got a big in and out truck and uh, got like a <laughs> bunch of pizza and uh, yes we did like a big <laughs> poker tournament and i had because it was my 16 year of my career throughout the whole finals so i mean not the finals throughout the playoffs with detroit Anything I could grab, I mean, I was grabbing as a souvenir. I was really enjoying the whole journey, you know. And so when, when, we, when we got to do the Stanley Cup party in my house, we did like a poker tournament. Whoever would win would get like a number of tickets. And then we threw all the tickets in a bowl, and I started giving away like jerseys and sticks of all the guys that had played in the Red Wings that won the Cup. And then we did this whole party all night. And, uh, and then I, at the end, uh, we said, all right, we poured a champagne drink out of the cup. Like everybody, I think we had over 300 people. And it was a blast. We had a real fun. The next night, we were in Malibu with Chris Chelios. He had a party there. And then Sunday, I had it, my, my family, we, we got a permit to go at the Hollywood sign. So we brought it all, we hiked all the way down the Hollywood sign, took some pictures. We had, pictures didn't turn out good because the photographer's down the street all the way below. We didn't realize, <laughs> we, we didn't have <laughs> the photographer idea, zoom. but it was still pretty cool. And we went to Universal Studio and did the uh, Jurassic Park ride. We didn't do the drop, but we did with the cup and we had a lot of fun with it. <laughs> I'll tell you what though, by the time Sunday night, it was 11 p.m. and I was like, I basically told the guy, because there's a guy that travels with the cup He's a teacher, and all summer he goes from one party to another. He's a great guy, sleeps all day long in your house because, you know, he's got to catch up on his, on his sleeps that he missed. But I remember at 11 o'clock that night, I said, take it back, I'm done. Like, <laughs> your, your shoulders are tired, you're just like, it's three days of hard partying. It was, it was fun, though. Pretty good. So going back to 93 for a second. At the end of that season, you come up to us, what were you thinking about the future of hockey, of hockey in Los Angeles, of the NHL, of your career. You must have been incredibly optimistic, I imagine. What, what were your thoughts? Yeah, well, the future of hockey, like, like I said, I mean, in, when, if you go back to 88, 89, 90, 91 on the Kings, when we got Wayne Gretzky to Bruce McNall got, and we, we were a good team, we had a buzz. If you look back, Anaheim appeared, San Jose got on the map. We had a team in Phoenix, a team in Dallas. You Tampa exploded Bay, the league. Tampa Bay and Florida. And those teams, in those days, every preseason, we would do a tour. We would play all those markets with Wayne. And they were trying to, to sell him. And, I, and I'm a firm believer that the LA Kings, with Wayne Gretzky, is the, is the reason all those teams appeared because they showed they were capable markets. And then... But I do remember in 93 when we lost, we were in the locker room in Montreal, and I looked at Rob Blake, I go, man, because it's kind of hard. When you're in the locker room, you hear the crowd chanting on the other side, and it's like, it's like the ultimate down, because you battle all this time, you, you lost the big one, and uh, I remember I said, we'll be right back next year. Man, was I wrong. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> you know? What happened? Well, we, you know, over the, the summer, I mean, uh, you know, our... Bruce McNall, I think, had some trouble. I think it started right there. None, I don't think. I know he did, but I mean, I re I'm going on my memory. That's when his trouble started. We had all kinds of legal issues. We ended up losing a few players. Marty McSorley left. We, we lost uh, Thomas Sandstrom. We, I don't know if they were contracts at the time, but it just we were never quite the same. And uh, the next year, uh, we, we didn't make the playoffs. I mean, it was it was it was terrible, you know. And and. Uh, I ended up leaving the le the year after and uh, getting your Stanley Cup, <laughs> yeah, eventually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but it, it it just was never the same. I came back in LA in '97, '98, and that was the first time we made the playoffs since '93 at the time. Now, so okay, still the league is doing very well, mm -hmm. even though even though the Kings weren't doing as well. 
Wait, what happened? What happened with why did you wind up missing the season? What do you learn from that in terms of where, you know, the fact that it kind of stunted hockey for a while? And what can the NBA take from that? These are questions that I, looking at the clock, I realize he does not have time to answer at this hmm. moment. Phew. However, in a matter of moments. <laughs> but you're not done yet. However, <laughs> however coming up, he's going to have a couple minutes to think about these answers. What should the NBA do, right? Like, who knows better than this guy? Luke Robitaille is going to give you an in-depth dissertation on all those topics about three or four minutes from now. We are at lunch with a legend. The legend is obviously Hall of Famer Luke Robitaille of L.A. Kings fame. <laughs> Morton's the Steakhouse, downtown L.A., Max and Marcellus, Mark Willard, sitting in for Marcellus Wiley, 710 ESPN. And you are listening to Max and Marcellus here on 710 ESPN. Mark Willard sitting in for Marcellus Wiley. Luke Robitaille is the legend. This is Lunch with a Legend here at Morton's Steakhouse in downtown Los Angeles. A man who was drafted in the ninth round 100 spots after Tom Glavin, the pitcher, who said he would never play hockey. Everyone said he couldn't skate well enough. He's in the Hall of Fame. He won the Stanley Cup. He took the Kings to a Stanley Cup Finals in 1993. We were talking before the break, Luke Robitaille, about where hockey was at its apex with you and Gretzky here in L.A. and what happened to it that resulted in the year lost and the diminished popularity compared to then and what the NBA could learn from all of this. What are your thoughts? Well... I don't know what the NBA can learn, but I, I, I do know, like in 94, when uh, we had the first lockout, if you remember, we had the puck that was colorful puck, like it was shooting. And I like that on was, TV yeah. with the streaking <laughs> puck, yeah. The Rangers had just won the Cup the year before we yeah. lost in the finals, and there, there was definitely a, a big buzz, and, but the salaries kept going up, so they needed to be an adjustment at the time. And then we went on, and uh, it seems like our league just was not like really promoting players. Like There was like a... There was a certain miss, and uh, obviously in, in the lockout in 2004, I mean, it's just the salaries in our league just escalated. I, I mean, uh, you know, you could tell now I'm not a player. I'm on the management side. Yeah. Until <laughs> <laughs> At the time, <laughs> no, you wouldn't be talking that. At the time, I'm like, what? Like, what do you mean? <laughs> no, but, but seriously, I mean, I, 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 if I'm remembering correctly, I mean, uh, I think the players were getting 70, 70 – percent and above of the revenue of the league were going to the players so there needed to be an adjustment I was on the player side at the time uh, to be honest with you it was a uh, it was difficult I mean it's certainly something you you try to understand as much as you can as a player probably to a fault a lot of times when those lockouts happen like for us in the NHL there was 700 players and a lot of players probably are not involved enough I would say you know you get like a these seven or eight players or a group of maybe a dozen guys that seems to know what's going on, but you still got, like in the NBA, I think there's three or 400 players, and you probably, if you'd go and talk to the 250, 300 guys that are not aware, they probably don't know much, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of times that, that's a problem. Then when a deal gets done, everybody complains, but uh, probably sometimes that's, a, and then what? if you take the ownership group, there's only 30 guys, so they know exactly what's going and on. And they're billionaires for a reason. What, what about well, go ahead, Mark. I'm sorry. Well, no, I was going to say that there's, you know, in addition to what you just said, um, with what the NBA is facing right now, in your experience, when a year is missed in sports, the collateral damage amongst fans is what? Well, it's, uh, it, it, you know, if you, if you look at the NHL and, and you say, okay, it's the fourth league of the, of the, 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 the four big leagues and and you look at the way it was, and everybody said, you know, I mean, literally no one in the United States was talking about <laughs> when we were in a lockout. That's how much it seemed like people were just moving on, you know. And, and a lot of people had said, well, the NHL won't survive. And today the NHL is better than ever. I mean, it is. I mean, is it more popular than ever, though? I think so. Our ratings are way up. I mean, uh, you look at our buildings, they're 95%, 94% and above. Uh, our revenue is, uh, is gone from 2 to $3 billion as a league. And, uh, you know, it's healthier than it's ever been. We have, you know, some big events that we're doing the outdoor game, you know, on, on, uh, January, on January 1st. And then our Stanley Cup finals, the last three years, are, our ratings have improved every year. And uh, we're healthier than ever. And, uh, you know, there was, you know, but at the time, I could tell you from a player's side, we weren't happy of the deal. And today, 
the players are making more money today than they were before. So, so is the lesson for the NBA then that that the owners, because some of these M the N NHL owners also own NBA teams, and they feel that their experience with missing a season was overall a good one because they were able to break the players and get the deal they wanted essentially. And, and as you now claim, the league is healthier as a result. Um, do you think that the lesson for NBA owners, that they learn that lesson, and they're thinking, hey, if it takes a year of sitting out in order to make the league more to our liking, that's a good thing? Because my, my impression is, at least, at least from the enthusiasm out here, is that it wasn't a good thing, that there was more enthusiasm for hockey back then, let's say in the mid-90s, than there is now for hockey. Mm -hmm. And I think partly that's because they missed the season. So the, the owners kind of cut off their nose to spite their face. What's your impression of that? I mean, I don't believe anyone wants to cancel a season. I mean, I don't believe you buy an NBA or NHL franchise thinking I'm, I'm going to cancel a season. I, I, I do believe that if you're, if you're a businessman and, you're, you know, you, I don't think you buy a team thinking you're going to make hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, trust me, I'm on the business side. I know that now. But, but I, I, I don't believe, too, even though you're a billionaire, you want to write a check every year. Mm -hmm. And that makes it that makes it difficult for your team lose money every year after year after year after the first five years You're like, oh, yeah, we're gonna win. Don't worry. We'll do it. But year 10 12 15 you, there comes a time you say that's enough, you know And I think there's an adjustment there and and I, I can't speak for the NBA because I don't know where the deal is but if an owner is willing to say let's not play because everybody that owns teams they love the game they you, know, you don't buy a team because you don't love the NBA or you don't love the NHL so that means there's an adjustment that needs to be done, and it's a give and take. And as we're seeing now, they're starting to they, – obviously, the players have given, and they're still trying to, to tweak. I, I, I'm, I would be very shocked that there's no season. I, I think they're, they're getting very close. But I do believe that everybody's a fan. And, and you know, I was on the player side where we gave in. We weren't happy, and then we figured out later. We're like, well, that wasn't that bad. <laughs> everybody's still right. doing okay, you know, and – Here's what you can't speak to as far as the NBA situation. It creates a heck of an opportunity for the NHL. How, wh what is that opportunity in your words? And is there anything special that hockey should be doing right now to take advantage of it? Well, it's kind of funny. We're, we're not doing, we're trying to do different things, but really we're not doing anything special except like for us, if I'll speak for the Kings. We know our team is better. We know we made the right moves in the last five years. We know this summer we acquired some premier players and Mike Richards, Simon Gagne, and so forth. And we believe that our team is going to compete for the Stanley Cup. Now, when you're in LA, if you can compete for the Stanley Cup, you're going to draw no matter what. And, and we're seeing it right now. We're drawing. The one thing that we do know is that come, there's going to come a time, and probably it is now, where people are like, you know, I, I wish I could watch sports, and I heard the Kings are pretty good, so I might as well watch them. So that's going to happen. But, but from, from any other standpoint, saying, okay, let's go try to get them. Let's call all the fans and so <laughs> forth. I, I don't believe we should do that. But, but organically, I think if there's no NBA and our team is successful, we'll do better. From a league standpoint, I think it's a little bit more difficult because keep in mind, too, First of all, there's not much you could do, and then the other side, our CBA is up next year, so <laughs> we better Keep be your careful. fingers crossed. <laughs> right, right, right. Basically, you're in L.A. You win. Everything's going to be okay. Yeah, I mean, this is a city where we have many, many different choices. You need to be successful, and you need to try to be successful every year to be successful in this town. Hall of Famer Luke Robitaille, we have 28 seconds left. Is there anything you'd like to tell your many fans? Where's my steak? No. <laughs> <laughs> that only took two. That's right. No, I want to thank the fans of LA have been so good to me. They've been great to my family and to the LA Kings. So thanks a lot, you guys. This is great. This was a lot of fun. Lunch with a legend, a Hall of Famer. How's that for a legend? The great Luke Lorbataille, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Stanley That's Cup right. champion. LA Kings uh, executive now, right? Is it fair to call you an executive? Yeah, you can, you can do What's that. What's your official title? President of Business Operations. I'd say that's an executive. That's an executive. <laughs> Thanks a million. This has been Lunch with a Legend on Max and Marcellus, 710 ESPN.